All right. So this evening is uh, January 7th. It is 2009, one day before Elvis's birthday, the day of my pastor's birthday, Buzz Treme. That's why we were praying for him earlier. He turned 60 today. Uh, and our message tonight is Tester of Metals. You got me? Like someone who tests metals, but it's called Tester of Metals. Turn with me to Jeremiah 6. And uh, when you get there, say there. There. When the rest of you get there, say there. There. <laughs> okay. Jeremiah 6, verse 26, is a word that God spoke to Jeremiah about his role. I have to get in 626. Oh, you're kidding me. <laughs> Ah, 627. I have made you a tester of metals and my people the ore that you may observe and test their ways. This is an amazing time in Israel's history. A national prophet has been called. The national prophet has been told you should be more scared of me than you should be of these people and they are not going to accept your message but I will make you hard like flint I will make you unyielding. And then God told Jeremiah that he would make him like a tester of metals. And one of the first messages I ever heard on this was preached by Pastor Piro, and it was a testing stone. It turns out that metals all have different densities. They all have different properties. And you can test them in different ways. One of the most basic is that you put a flame to them. And when you put a flame to them, they give off a different kind of light. For instance, if you put a piece of copper over a Bunsen burner, the flame turns green immediately. It's one of the ways you know if copper is in something. But before that, before you ever had fire to test metal, you struck metal against something. And if it dented, you knew that it might not be iron. It might be something less than iron. If it was brittle, you knew what kind of metal it was. God was going to use a man giving God's word out to the people like a tester of metals before the people and the people were the metal. When we turn to Hebrews 4, which you can do now, you can see that the word of God plays this role in our lives always, whether it's Jeremiah who's giving it, your next door neighbor who's giving it, or a billboard that you read on the side of the road. Something about hearing God's word for us becomes testing like testing of metal. When you hear it, you immediately have choices to make. The choices show up in our actions. They show up in our deeds. They show up in the life that we live. In Hebrews, the fourth chapter and twelfth verse, we hear these words. For the word of God is living and active, sharper than any double-edged sword. It penetrates even to dividing soul and spirit. You know, when you're describing the functions of man, it's pretty easy to talk about what the body does. It's pretty easy to talk about your spirit. It is much harder to find the distinction between a man's spirit and a man's soul. Sometimes in English we use the words absolutely interchangeably. When speaking of the Godhead, it's pretty easy to distinguish the Son from the Father and the Spirit. The Son's in a body. He walked around on the earth. You could touch him. You could touch the nails in his hands and the hole in his side. But when talking about the distinction between the Father, who the Word says is Spirit, and the Holy Spirit, it's much more difficult to find those obvious distinctions, although they're there. I say all of this to say that the Word of God is so sharp, so precise, such a tester of human beings, that in the most difficult areas in your life to delineate between, the Word does this for us. Joints and marrow, it judges the thoughts and the attitudes of the heart. How many times have you heard someone say, God knows my heart? How many times have you heard it? Anybody in here heard it? If you don't talk to me, I'm going to quit now. Okay? Many, many times. I've said it a lot. We've all said it a lot. Do you know how God knows the thoughts and attitudes of your heart? Through your actions. By the way that you react to His Word. Now, I can tell you, when you don't speak to me now, 
and I'm up here speaking, I have no way of judging the thoughts and attitudes of your heart. I don't know whether the word's getting in, not getting in. I don't know whether you'd be rather watching 24 or sleeping or playing bridge or poker or something else. But when you hear that word and you respond to it with an action, all of the sudden I get some feedback that lets me know about where you are. God is no different. We focus on his omnipotence and his omniscience to the point that it is perilous to us. We say God knows and he may, but do you know? What about your life shows that when tested by the metal of the word, when your thoughts and attitudes of your heart are judged, what about the actions in your life say, I am a lover of God? Now, I'm not telling you that yours don't. I'm simply asking a rhetorical question. When we consider this kind of thing, we need to understand that our God sends His Word out and it judges us. The way that it judges us is not by our intellectual acceptance of it. What we are judged by is how we respond to it. No differently than if I stand here and ask you a question and what I get is... God is looking for a response from His Word. When His Word goes out, He wants you to respond to it. Having said that, we need to look and see sometimes what our response is. Look in Jeremiah 9 for me. I'm going to go back and forth a little bit. But that's okay because you guys just about have this memorized, right? In Jeremiah 9... One of the things that we will see is that after the word has penetrated your heart, gotten into your attitude, gotten into the very marrow of your joints, we learn certain things. Uh, when you are a brand new Christian, sometimes it is normal for you to talk about all that you can do, right? As if the kingdom of God needed something from you. You are God's man of power for the hour. You are there because if you were not, God couldn't do it without you. Have you never met a Christian like this? Come on, are y'all lying? Because you knew me. Most of you knew me when I got born again and this was me. I went to a baseball game at a denominational church the first weekend I was saved. And when a fist fight broke out in cursing, I decided that God had me there for one reason. And I went and grabbed as many of them by the neck and drug them off the field as I could. Because I thought that I was there for God. Right? Look at Jeremiah 9. We're going to start in the 23rd verse. This is what the Lord says. Let not the wise man boast of his wisdom. If you're wise, if this is an attribute of yours, if everywhere you go people think, wow, wow, the, the wisdom of Cody Schmidt is amazing. Then this could be something that Cody boasted in. Or the strong man boast of his strength. Everywhere Suzanne goes, people could say, my God, for a woman her size, can you believe she can bench press a car? <laughs> and she could get proud of this. Suzanne could say, hey, you know, for, for a woman I'm pretty strong, right? Maybe for anybody I'm pretty strong. Or a rich man boast of his riches. Now I haven't met very many people that talked openly about how rich they are, but everything about their life tries to show you they have money. I mean, they don't wear all of those clothes with the emblems on them and the certain cars with the certain emblems on them for no reason. But let him who boasts, boast about this, that he understands and knows me. Now, it's one thing to say, I know the Lord, or I know who the Lord is. But how many of you say, I understand him? Most of the church world is stuck in a position where what we say is, the Lord's ways are mysterious. They're beyond us. Who can know His workings? We quote those scriptures. No eye has seen, no ear has heard without quoting the rest of the sentence. But He has revealed it to us by His Spirit. I tell you this to say, as the Word judges our hearts, as it's a testing stone for us, something should happen. What we begin to learn is that our strength is not important, that our wisdom is not important, that our resources are not important, that what is important is recognizing the working of God in your own life 
and the lives of the people around you and knowing him. Do you hear that Paul started to talk about his accomplishments in the book of Corinthians? Especially in the second book. And he said, let him who boasts, boast in the Lord. He's quoting Jeremiah. He's quoting this. He starts to get wrapped up in defending himself against the super apostles. And he stops it and says, I'd be a fool to talk like this. But you drove me to it. Let him who boasts, boast in the Lord. The word should teach us one resounding thing. Everything that is good, everything that is worth having, comes from understanding more about God and walking in His precepts. That I am the Lord and that I exercise kindness, justice, and righteousness on earth. For in these I delight. Have you ever had trouble seeing God as kind? Be honest. You ever experienced something difficult and you thought, why would God let this happen? Have you ever had problems seeing God as just? Well, why did this happen to me? Or why is this happening to the one that I love? And over there, I remember watching people try to have babies and hearing that a crack addicted baby was born. And I thought, where's the justice in that? Something to boast in is when the word has penetrated us to the point and we have swam in it enough then none of those things shake us because we understand the Lord. We may not understand everything that He's doing, but we understand Him. And we can rest, relax, and say, God must have a purpose in this. But you know how you're tested? You're tested when our actions don't compare to His Word. And we can cross our arms and say, this is the way that I am. Or, but you don't understand me. Or, but my circumstances are different. Where would the first century Christians be? Where would you be if you had to live in the first century? How many of us have had our property confiscated for Jesus? Anybody in here had that happen to you? No. Anybody in here been publicly beaten for the gospel? No. no. Anybody in here ever had their wife or babies dragged off and killed for Jesus? No. Where would we be? At some point, we have to realistically look at our lives against the testing stone. And you know where the real testing is in our life? It's in those trials. In your trials, do we do what the Word says or not? You say, well, Eric, why are you trying to force that on me? Or that's what you do. Or, no, this is all mankind is tested by His Word. He is a testing stone for all of us, for all mankind. But I want to tell you something. When you begin to understand who God is, when you have, through constant training, you have put this into practice, Hebrews says that it is through constant use that the mature learn to distinguish between what is good and evil. Through constant use, you've obtained something. You've obtained something worth boasting about. It's called an unshakable faith. It doesn't mean that you'll never have rough days. It doesn't mean that you won't mourn. It means that you're confident in the character of God. And friends, that's about the most important thing that we could possibly have. You might be able to debate with me about eschatology all day long. You might be able to authoritatively speak about scriptures on divorce. You might be able to quote all 613 mitzvahs from the Tanakh. But if you can't hang on to your revelation of who God is during your most difficult hours, what good are any of those things for you? And what does your faith really worth? But praise God... Praise God, none of us are defined by a single moment in time. This is a lifelong process. And you know what happens? We learn as much from the days that we fail as the days that we get it right, and something begins to happen. Our understanding of who God is starts to grow. And you know what the number one revelation that comes to us in that moment is? He's merciful. He doesn't throw us away. When He throws us against the testing stone and we don't leave the right kind of mark, it's not pure gold. He doesn't throw us away. What does He do? He purifies us. How do you purify a metal? You put it back in a furnace. You give it more opportunities to pass those tests. Let me ask you something. When you reflect on last year, did you fail any tests? Yes. Or did all of you do just that much better than I did? You failed some tests? Yes. This year you have a chance not to. Did you pass any tests this last year that you failed the year before? I know some of you did. I've watched you. Turn with me to Deuteronomy 29.
I've read this scripture to you before, but I am unabashedly going to cram it down your throat one more time. It's 29, 29. Are y'all just this meditating tonight? Or are you uh, something wrong with you? Live. Live. That's right. I'm about to stop the service and speak life into you. I haven't felt like this since I preached in a denominational church. We're just old and tired. But we're just old and tired. All right. We'll pray for resurrection power. Listen to the 29th chapter and 29th verse. The secret things belong to the Lord our God, but the things revealed belong to us and to our children forever, that we may follow all the words of this law. There are things you cannot know about yourself and cannot know about God simply by reading a book. But as the word that comes out of his Bible impacts your life, penetrates your heart, penetrates the marrow of your bones and divides your thoughts from your spirit, you learn something about yourself. You learn something about God and it belongs to you forever. It can't be taken away from you. As I began to think about this process today and began to look at it, I remembered that at the bonfire, God spoke to me out of Ecclesiastes 3. And He began to show me that there was a season for everything under heaven and that people would be in different seasons in our church this year. No longer did I need to get you all in one row pulling a chain in the same direction. We didn't need to do that. There was not a church vision for everyone. The church vision was each of you performing the task that God has called you to perform. Amen. And in the third chapter of Ecclesiastes, you hear these words, and I want you to listen to them. I want you to contemplate them so that they'll belong to you forever. Tell me when you're in Ecclesiastes 3. Amen. After speaking about what there's a time to do over and over and over, in the ninth verse, it says, What does the worker gain from his toil? I have seen the burden that God has laid on men. He has made everything beautiful in its time. He has also set eternity in the hearts of men. Yet they cannot fathom what God has done from beginning to end. I know that there is nothing better for men than to be happy and to do good while they live. In this next year, what I am hoping is occurring in our lives, what I believe by faith in my God is occurring in our lives, is that you have been impacted by the Word. You are slamming your life up against the standard in the Word like a metal worker would test a metal. And that every time you see that your life is falling short or is doing well, you're learning something that belongs to you and you alone forever. No longer is it a mystery how you should act. No longer is it a mystery what your God is like. But you are able to boast in what God is doing in your life. Doing in your life uniquely. This is part of the vision of our church. That God would raise up life-changing ministries. It's why we put the word, word plural on the sign and in our mission statement. Ephesians 2 tells us that God has prepared works in advance for you to do. Good works. It's nothing better for a man that he do that he be happy and do good while he lives. <coughs> Everything's beautiful in a season, he said. What's beautiful for you this year? What is it a beautiful time for? You know, there are times I hate to cut the grass. And there's other days it is a glorious, beautiful thing to do. There was a time in my life where I had to work in a chemical plant and I thought that it was the lowest level of hell that the Greeks called Tartarus. <laughs> and there are other times that I enjoyed it. It's on top of a pipe rack looking at the beautiful creation thinking that the clouds were swaying and worshiping God. Everything can be beautiful in a season. You know what else? Everything can be absolutely miserable in a season. We can boast in the fact that our lives have been tested by the word that we know who we are and we know who God is and then suddenly things become beautiful. If you've been depressed for more than a day, something's wrong. It's wrong. If you've been depressed for a, a month, something's wrong. If you've been depressed for a few years, you need to seek medical and spiritual help. 
He really did. This is not the life that God has called us to live. We are supposed to be, when tested against the testing stone, we are supposed to be improving. We're supposed to begin to see things that are beautiful around us. We're supposed to want to engage the rest of humanity and do good while we live. This is the mark of Christianity. If we fall short of that mark, we sin. And that's the definition of sin. I think that this year will be a year when people are not riding on each other's coattails. But they're doing what God called them to do. Y'all want to do what God's called you to do? Yes. Yes. With yes. all my heart. This is the only reason that I'm here. I am not in Sugarland, Texas to build a big church. Mm -hmm. I'm not here to put away money. A lot of you would be really surprised to see how our finances work. Mm -hmm. I'm not here to build a name for myself. That's why it's not on the sign. I'm here to teach people to be excited about God. The, the thing that is in the mezuzah that hangs on my front door is to excite people about God. Do you understand why it's difficult for me to stand on a Wednesday night and see stone faces? <laughs> and yet my job is to do what he tells me to do. Your job is to respond. See, I want to be responsive to God's word. I want to do the things that he's called me to do. I want to learn that everything's beautiful in its season. Even if it's a season of correction. How many of you have thought correction was beautiful? <laughs> Probably not. I know in my dealings with you, you've not found it beautiful. <laughs> How many of you, after a correction has passed, have found the results beautiful? Oh, yeah. Unbelievable. Some of the growth and the fruit that's on your lives now, it's unbelievable. It's like the rising of someone from the dead. And you know what? That belongs to you forever. It's yours. It's your trophy between you and God. Where you were and where you are now is like a placard on your life that says God is great. That's what it's supposed to be. We're supposed to be like a letter commending God, not ourselves. Boasting in the Lord. This is supposed to be the fruit of God's word going out. You ever have something that was sweet and tasted good? And so you got another bowl of it? And then another bowl? In addition to getting fat, everything becomes less sweet when it becomes less rare. Mm -hmm. yeah. One of the real problems is that we're absolutely inundated with preaching and teaching. We're absolutely inundated with access to God's Word. When you read the stories of missionaries, the reason they're so exciting is because they're in areas where people had a lack of God's Word, so they saw it as something precious. And they seriously tested their lives against it. And they wanted with all their hearts for their lives to measure up to it. One of my favorite stories is about a man who prayed six months to get a glimpse of a Bible. And then when he got it, like a little kid that received a teddy bear, he slept with it in his bed. And when he went to work, he carried it under his shirt because he didn't want to be far from it. How many of us love the Word of God like that? We throw our Bible in the back seat of our car without thought to what it does to the pages. And I'm not talking about worshiping a book. I'm talking about valuing this process. Do you disdain it when somebody points out shortcomings in your life? Does it make you not like them? Make you want to stay away from them? I absolutely know that it does. Because some of you, if I say the smallest thing about correction, I don't see you for a few weeks. And if I see you, you duck your head and walk away. You know what? The Bible says that this is like oil, a medicine, a kindness. The best times in my life, standing in the hallway, somebody told me how I could preach better. I love it. I appreciate it. I see that as a genuine interest in my life. This is the right way to learn and grow and mature in the Lord. If you're never disciplined, you're surely not loved. Do you want to be loved? Me too. Turn with me to Matthew 25. <clears throat> There. Well, good or not, it's what it is, and this is where God called you. So, you know. The thing that you fight the most as a pastor, honestly, it's true in all things that you're called to. It's just most evident in me because I'm standing up here in the view of all of you. You know, all of you are staring in one place right now. Uh, 
Imagine that every service, everybody in this room was staring at you for two hours. Okay? And then when there's any problem anywhere, because everybody's staring at you, they generally attribute it to you. It's an interesting place to be. Uh, the thing that you fight with the most as a pastor is discouragement. And the reason is, your job is to encourage the flock, to correct the flock, to bring the flock closer to Jesus. And in doing that, you get intimately acquainted with the flock. Right? You ever liked somebody from a distance and then you got to know them and you were surprised how flawed their lives were? <laughs> yeah. Anybody ever got to know you in that way? Yeah. Like the first night they come over, you play a board game, it's great. Uh, the next time, y'all get to talk a little more and suddenly they're not returning your phone calls? <laughs> humanity is messed up. And the only hope for humanity is that we embrace the standard in God's Word measure ourselves by it and grow. Not to become beat down of what we're not doing because there is hope for us to grow and do better. That's the hope of Christianity. It's, hear how the word says it, Christ being formed in you. Did you think that that was a spiritual process? Christ being formed in you? Like, uh, oh Jesus, be formed in me. It happened. It's not. It's not. You know what it is? It's like iron slamming against iron. That's what it's like. It's your will slamming against his over and over and over and finding out which one moves. It's about being stubborn in your bold clinging to the word of God with confidence that it will produce what you want, what God wants. You in Matthew 25? Yes. Wow, because this is a frightening parable. It is such a frightening parable that most theologians... Apply it solely to Israel because we give them everything we don't like. Or to the lost. Isn't it good when we can relegate any teaching to either a group other than yourself or just to the lost people, right? Because then we're safely excluded from the possibility that it could apply to us in any personal way. Well, let me tell you, out of all the churches you could be in, even on this road... God put you in this one. And out of all the messages that I could preach, out of all the places in the Word, this is the one that He gave me. So who do you think it's for? Mm. You. That's right. Mm -hmm. And me with you. Yeah. Okay, so the uh, 25th chapter, 14th verse. Again, if we're speaking of the kingdom of God here, it will be like a man going on a journey who called his servants and entrusted his property to them. Whose property? His property. And what did he do with it? Entrusted. He entrusted it. This is like when I have something that is precious to me. I say, oh man, I love this. It's awesome. It's really important to me. But here, I'm going to give it to you for a while. The missionary that we support in Brazil's name is Stephen Young. And he saved his money. Stephen came from a family that did not have much. He was even at the school that we were at, at the mercy of other people. So he was raised in humble circumstances. And he worked at a Bible and bookstore, a Christian store, and saved and saved and sta saved because the thing that he wanted most in 1993 was an electronic Bible. A little red electronic Bible with a, a screen that you could read three lines on at a time. Now you gotta give us a break. This is before everybody was walking around with laptops, okay? This is before, uh, I mean, we were all still using Strong's Concordance, and that was it. And he was so excited about it. And he loaned it to me. And when he loaned it to me, he showed me how to put it in its case. Right? How to zip it up, how to hold it. And when he handed this thing to me that is about the size of a wallet, he handed it to me with two hands. You know how I remember all of that so clearly? Because I dropped it and broke it. <laughs> he entrusted something important to me, and I broke it. You know what's worse than that? I had just gotten married. I was making $4 an hour and I didn't have the money to replace it. You know how I knew Stephen really loved Jesus? With a tear in his eye. He said, that's okay, Eric. It's okay. I know you can't replace it. It's okay. And, and all the years that I knew him, it really was okay. You ever have somebody tell you it's okay, but every argument you get in for the next five years, it comes up? It's called gunny sacking. They say it's fine. They put it in the gunny sack for a more useful battle. Right? It's the trump card in every discussion you'll ever have, 
every time after that, it really was okay with Stephen. You know why? The word said you shall not have any idols in your life. Mm. And he took it seriously. You know what's more impressive about that? Stephen, unlike me at the time, had not experienced some of the spiritual gifts that I had. He was the only one of the peers that I had from this group that didn't have a problem with it. He said, you pray, I'll pray, I'll turn off my hearing aid. Sound like a mature view to me, you know? Today, out of all of those people, he's still serving Jesus in other lands. You know why? When the word hit him as a testing zone, he made corrections. He wanted to live out the word. He didn't care what people thought. He didn't care what he had or what he lost. He just wanted to do well with what he was entrusted with. Mm -hmm. Again, it would be like a man going on a journey who called his servants and entrusted his property to them. 1 Corinthians 4, the first verse begins speaking of Paul. And Paul says, men should regard us as men entrusted with the secret things of God. When he was talking about the secret things of God, he's speaking of the same thing that Deuteronomy 29, 29 was speaking of. And Proverbs 25, 2. He's talking about those things which had been revealed from heaven. And they had been entrusted like somebody's property to him. What lesson have you learned from God in the last few years that you view as important like your most favorite possession? Did you know that the scripture says that when a teacher of the law brings both old and new things out of the word, it is like treasure in a storehouse? How many treasures are you holding on to? Have you ever quoted the, the scripture that said, you shall not cast your pearls before swine? What did you think it meant? Did you think that that meant you don't say nice things to ugly people? It means those things that God revealed to you that are precious to you. That are only about you and Him. Those things where you understand Him better in an area because of your constant contact with His Word. And you feel like He understands you better. And you've grown in intimacy. That's what you don't let get trampled on. You keep that. It's, personal. it's your treasure. What are you treasuring up? World of Warcraft? Commodore 64? Sega? Poker? What is it that you treasure? Your car? Even your Bible cover could be a treasure if you weren't careful. What is important in this life is that we recognize the beautiful seasons that we're in, that we are happy and we do good while we live. Because God has prepared in advance certain things for us to do. And he entrusted it to us like a man would entrust his property to his servants. We're going to be judged according to what we do. And I don't say that so that you'll be fearful. I say it so that you'll be motivated. How much time, if you had been entrusted with a Ferrari right now, would you spend riding a bicycle? So what is it that God's entrusted you to do? And what bicycle do you forsake the Ferrari for? See, I determined in my heart, there's only so much time. I'm watching the men who taught me in the word, the people who I have respected all of my life are now in a stage in their life where they're watching their parents die, where they're feeling older, when things that they want to do, they have to think about whether they can do. And you know what? I know that one day some of you men will be calling me and I'll be in that same shape. Others of you will have already gone on to be with Jesus. There are only so many days in which... We have daylight to work. Night's going to come when no man can work. What are we going to do with the time we've been given? I want to work. A scripture worth writing down is Psalm 138. It's the 8th verse. It said, The Lord will fulfill His purpose for me. Mm -hmm. You know what you were entrusted with? What was like property? His purpose for your life. He entrusted that to you. And it says the Lord will fulfill His purpose for me. And yet there's free will involved. So God entrusted a purpose for your life like a man entrusts property to someone. And then He waits to see what you do with that purpose. Will it be disappointed? Rather, will you be disappointed when you stand before Him? There are so many failings in my life that it would probably bore you. To hear about them. And yet I don't feel like a failure. 
There are so many areas in my life where I know I must improve, and yet I don't feel subpar. The overwhelming feeling that I have that gives me a drive to wake up each day is that I'm in the center of God's purpose for my life. Friends, there is no more important thing that you can have. And that's a secret thing that was entrusted to me. I only share these pearls with you because you're a flock that was entrusted to me. If you were just any old Joe off the, sh off the street, the guy's doing Kung Fu next door or something, I might not care enough to tell you. But I care about you. And I want you to know. Not so that you see me any differently. I'm curious, what is it that makes you get out of bed during the day? To build a better retirement? To earn the esteem of your peers. How fickle are all of those things? How many people last month lost half their retirement? The esteem of your peers probably is completely dependent on you doing exactly what they want you to do. I want you to ram your life like a man running into a brick wall up against the word. I want you to examine and then take steps. Te steps to be found pure and genuine. I want you to honestly assess, Lord, what is beautiful for me in this season? Last year may be a year of planting. Is this a year of reaping? Is this a year of plowing? What is this for me this year? Our church will function the best. You will function the best. When you know your place in the body and you fulfill that place. There's nobody in here that doesn't have a place in the body. There are certainly several of you in here that don't know what it is and make very little effort to engage it. But God has a purpose for all of you. He does. And the more of us that are doing that, the more of his work that gets done on the earth. That is an amazing thing. That the God of the universe would hinge his plan upon your actions. What power. What responsibility. What will you do with it? To one he gave five talents of money, to another two talents, and to another one talent. What's that next line say? Each according, Each according to his ability. If you have ever wondered why Adam got 37 talents and Eric got 36 cents, it's because he has the ability to do that. Say, but who determined that? God did. God did. You know what? I can barely clap and beat, but I have a good time trying. You can spend all of your time counting everyone else's talents, or you can do something to multiply your own. Amen. More than that, there's a whole other group of people that does not count people's talents. They don't even count their own. They just kind of sit around and do little with them. They're scared. They don't feel like they're competent to do anything. He gave you what you have according to to your ability. We're not going to be able to look and stand and face God and say the purpose for my life that you had I didn't have the ability <coughs> to do. He determined your purpose according to your design. Your function is according to the architectural map with which he laid you out. It's different than mine. It's different than the person on your right and your left. And maybe nobody in this room can rightly judge it. But you know what can? The word. This is why we compare our lives to the Word over and over and over. And maybe when the Word says, be joyful, always pray continually, maybe what we call joyful in Steve's life is different than what we call joyful in Eric's life. I don't know. But I do know that the Word will judge the attitudes and the thoughts of both of our hearts so that we can make adjustments about it. Saints, do you see where we're going with this? The church has been entrusted with things. Every week there's more teaching. Every week there's more worship. Almost every week there's more prophecy. How much is enough? How much before we say, okay, I have the ability to do what God's called me to do? Or will we always be in preparation? Will we always be preparing and never do it? I would rather you be half prepared and fully persuaded than fully prepared and only half persuaded. Our church is big on teaching. And I, I don't put people into positions unless I'm sure that they can handle those positions. And yet, I just want to see us do something. Something that's beautiful. That's been placed in <coughs> each of our hearts. And when we give people the freedom to do that, I'm always amazed. 
I had no idea that there were certain interests in the church. I didn't know that something that Miss Suzanne and Joy would enjoy sitting around doing is that needlepoint. Is that right? Crochet. It's crochet. See? Like, I could never see a distinction between those things, but they quickly corrected me because it's important to them. I had no idea that my son would be an avid duck hunter and that he would want to go without him every chance that he got. I had no idea. But when you give people the freedom to do things, maybe it's make silly videos, maybe it's work in a sound booth, something is beautiful in its season, and we need to find out what that is. We cannot sit around scared to try all of our lives. You know, it is a daring person that steps up and tries in an area where maybe someone's already doing well. Can you appreciate how difficult it must be uh, to lead worship if there's uh, accomplished musicians in the audience? Can you appreciate that? Yeah. How, how about if, if, is it Pavarotti? Yeah. Yeah, the fat Italian guy that's yeah. old and marries young women? Yeah. Yeah. If Pavarotti is here. He's Oh. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> if he were here, sitting on the first row, and you had to sing one of his songs, how hard would that be? Pretty hard. Pretty hard, huh? Could be intimidating. Yes. And yet, whatever the Almighty God has called us to do, He is pleased in watching us try to do. We can't judge ourselves by each other's performance. We can only judge ourselves by the Word. Nick is not here tonight. Uh can't imagine why in this church having a baby is no excuse. <laughs> Everybody's pretty amazed uh, about Nick's abilities on the drum, right? Mm -hmm. That's a pretty amazing thing. Not everybody can do that. Nick was overcome with fear the first time we asked him to do it because there was a drummer in the audience. Mm -hmm. Have any of you been sitting around secretly comparing Nick to whoever that other drummer was, wishing that Nick was better at what he did? <laughs> no. But that was a dominating thought in Nick's mind. Mm -hmm. What other kind of lie has the enemy told somebody besides Nick that has kept you from doing what you should be doing? Somebody once told me it's like my foot is near the gas pedal and I just can't push it. Hey, dude, I, I, I can sympathize. But how long are you going to sit and deliberate? I mean, how long? How many years of your life have already gone by? I want to have something to show. Again, it would be like a man going on a journey who called his servants and entrusted his property to them. To one, he gave five talents of money. To another, two talents. And to another one, one talent. Each according to his ability. Then he went on his journey. The man who had received five talents went at once and put his money to work and gained five more. The purpose in our lives, have we put it to work? Have we put it out there? Whatever you enjoy doing the most for the Lord. So, but nobody recognizes it. Well, the Lord does. If it's of Him, He does. So, but nobody knows about it. So, did God know about it? How much training do you need to witness to the Lord? <coughs> Lord, even in a church where they trained constantly and they talked about that stuff all the time, uh, I think the class was only six weeks. Any of you been more uh, saved more than six weeks? How much training does it take to love somebody that nobody else is loving? The purposes in our lives need to be put to work. And it's high time that excuses get put away. So also, the one with two talents gained two more. But the man who had received the one talent went off. The one who had the least to risk dug a hole in the ground and hid his master's money. I've shared this with you before so I won't, I won't go into great depth with it but I one time talked to a woman who had $100,000 in a checking account. The $100,000 that was in there was not $101,000 because she was worried about FDIC insurance. She didn't understand the way that the law was written and she didn't, she didn't get it and couldn't be taught. But she would not even let me change it to an interest-bearing checking account for her because she didn't want to lose any money and she was scared that if she had $100,000 in one cent, it was no longer insured. She couldn't have been more wrong. No amount of pamphlets, no amount of explaining could change it. No amount of instruction or correction would change her heart because fear had so gripped her. <coughs> 
When I looked at the date of the account's inception, it was near the time of my birth. You know what her opening deposit was? $100,000. Do you know what the difference between $100,000 and 1975 was? And when I was working at that bank, which was like 1996? What would $100,000 buy you in 1975 that it would not buy you in 1995? See, that's like theft. It is almost, if that had been someone else's money, it is as good as stealing from them because there was not even any interest gained to account for inflation. And why? Was it because no one instructed her? No, they instructed her. It's because fear had such a grip on her that she would not put her money to work. That seems so silly, doesn't it? You meet people like this every day that are doing this with what God has entrusted them with. The purpose in their lives, you might even be one of them. At some point, saints, fear has to rise to meet faith. We have to put ourselves out there risking. Oh, dear God, rejection. You know, one of the things about trying to avoid rejection all of the time is you're rejected. You've rejected yourself from the rest of society. We might have to risk something. Jesus gave his life. Fred was right when we talked earlier. The whole Christian life is about sacrifice. Your sacrifice might look differently than mine. It may take everything that you have to put a smile on your face tonight. And that would be a sacrifice. But that's what the Christian walk is about. It may be easy for you to smile, but hard for you to let loose and worship and express yourself before Him. But that is what the Christian life is about. It may be hard for you to talk to other people or to make new friends. But these are the things that the Christian life is about. How are you measuring up? He dug a hole in the ground. The only way I would adapt this parable if we were teaching in the United States is the hole wouldn't be in the ground, it would be in a church somewhere. And he hid his master's money. After a long time, the master of those servants returned and settled accounts with them. Settling of accounts. This is the Bema seat of Christ. This is where every man, woman, and child stands before the one that God has given authority to judge the living and the dead and gives an account for every deed done in the body, whether good or bad. If that kind of thing excites you, read 2 Corinthians 5. The man who had received the five talents brought the other five. Master, he said, you entrusted me with five talents. See, I've gained five more. The increase on his life was in proportion with the investment in his life. Ten talents is not better than six talents if you were only given three to start with. We are not comparing you to Reinhard Bunkum. We're not saying that you have to be Billy Graham. What we're saying is that according to your ability, God put a purpose on your life. And you will be judged according to what you did with that investment. Some of you think little of yourselves and need to be encouraged that the purpose is bigger than you thought. Occasionally there are people that think more of themselves than they should and they need to be told that they're smaller than they think. But in everybody's case, something has been entrusted to us and we are required to increase it. I want this year to be a year of increase. An increase in your lives, an increase in my life. If you fast one day a week and it's not hard for you anymore, try to. Mm -hmm. If whatever you're doing has become routine for you and there is no sacrifice in it anymore, do something different. Drive a new way to church. Sit in a new place. Check out in a different line at Kroger's. Do things a little differently and see if God won't meet you somewhere in that. How many times have you heard me say when you walk into Walmart, don't think you just went there to buy bread? Yeah. Any of you had any experiences? Yeah. Are you too scared to try? I started talking to Steve like that, and he's been running down every Jew we can find in every airport and telling him, God bless you. <laughs> and nobody's even beat him up yet. See, it works. <laughs> I started doing that. Somebody hit me right in the face in front of all my peers. But the Christian life's about sacrifice, and I would not change that event for anything in the world. It was a chance to find out where my love was for Jesus. After a long time, the master of those servants returned and settled accounts with them. The man who had received the five talents brought the other five. Master, he said, you entrusted me with five talents. See, I have gained five more. His master replied, well done, good 
and faithful servant. You have been faithful with a few things. I will put you in charge of many things. Come and share in your master's happiness. Number one, it makes God happy when you do what you were called to do. Number two, being faithful has nothing to do with what you believe. It has everything to do with what you do. Matthew 21, 43 speaks to a group of people that believed very well. The leaders in Israel. And it says the kingdom of God will be taken away from you. And given to a people who will produce its fruit. Make no mistake, our God is looking for an increase. And if investment in your life is a bad investment, he will invest in someone else's life. Faithfulness is doing what he called you to do. The man with two talents also came. Master, he said, you entrusted me with two talents. See, I have gained two more. His master replied, well done, good and faithful servant. You have been faithful with a few things. Have you noticed that no matter what he gives them, he says the same thing? Wouldn't you say five's more than two? But he calls it a few. And whatever they multiplied it, he says, I'm going to give you many things. Isn't that amazing? God's not concerned with the amounts. He's concerned with the increase. I will put you in charge of many things. Come and share in your master's happiness. The man who had received the one talent. Master, he said, I knew that you're a hard man. Isn't it amazing? I was encouraged to read this for a reason that would be difficult to explain to you. The people who were doing something with their lives, they came and they said, Master, with an explanation point and excitement. You know why? They were happy to be in his presence because they did what they were supposed to. The one who does nothing with his life, when he comes and he says, Master, it's with a little different tone. And the first thing that he does is begin to criticize the Master. I found out that when people are not doing what God called them to do, they are extra critical of me. In fact, I can, I can pick it out. <coughs> now I can sit in a meeting where someone is tearing me apart and go, hmm, you're unfulfilled because you're not doing what God called you to do. And I'm just the visible target. Right. It doesn't even hurt anymore. I can just smile. It makes us bitter at everybody around us when we're not doing what God put us here to do. But when you are, suddenly it's a beautiful day. Right, Brandon? It's a beautiful day suddenly. The whole world starts to get rose-colored glasses when you feel a divine sense of enablement on what you're doing. Now, come on, theologians. What is a divine sense of enablement? An anointing. Divine sense of enablement is an anointing. It's when you're divinely enabled to do something. You know what you're anointed to do? Whatever God called you to do. For Bezalel, it was working with wood. For Ohaliah, it was helping Bezalel. For Noah, it's building a boat. For Samuel, it's picking kings. For David... It's knocking down giants, playing stringed instruments, leading nations. One talent, two talent, five talents makes no difference. Did they give an increase? Mastery said, I knew that you were a hard man, harvesting where you have not sown and gathering where you have not scattered seed. So I was afraid and went out and hid your talent in the ground. See, here is what belongs to you. Here is what belongs to you. Know what belonged to him? was the increase with which he intended to receive. That's what belonged to him. You know, Proverbs 10.5 says that it is a wicked and lazy son that sleeps during the harvest. A wicked and lazy son that sleeps during the harvest. Didn't Jesus tell his disciples, open your eyes, the harvest is ripe, look around you? I have it on my desk little girl in our church I love very much gave it to me at a point in life where I needed to remember there was a harvest. I didn't see it around me. I don't want to be found to sleep during the harvest. And if you were asleep, then wake up, O sleeper. Let Christ's light shine upon you. Rise from the dead, Paul said. It's his resurrection life. And what is it that has you down or has you in a mode that feels sleepy? Facing death? We're Christians. Death is just a mountain for us that we step over. What else is it? 
your peers, your lack of needs? What is it that is bigger than Christ in your life? What made you hide your talent today, this month, or this year? What made you hide it? I don't want you to serve him because you're scared. I want you to serve him because it's the most fulfilling thing you could do. His master replied, You wicked, lazy servant. So you knew that I harvest where I have not sown and gather where I have not scattered seed. Well then, you should have put my money on deposit with the bankers so that when I returned, I would have received it back with interest. Take the talents from him and give it to the one who has the ten talents. For everyone who has will be given more. Did you hear that? If you increase in any way, you know what that is? It's growth in your life. If your life changes, if it grows towards God, He will give you all you need. But if you refuse, if like the lady, and that was a real example from my own life, that put $100,000 in a checking account, and despite the prophetic encouragement over and over and over, her fear did not let her do anything with it, then even what you have will be taken from you. I don't have time to give you the context, but if you want to write down Jeremiah 8.13, he speaks to a whole nation. And he says, I gave you beautiful things, beautiful pasture lands, beautiful children, beautiful wives. I gave you the most beautiful of everything. But you have not done what I asked you to do with it, so what you have will be taken from you. It was the Babylonian captivity. It was 70 years. He waited for all of those people to die so he could do something new with someone who would produce its fruit. If you get nothing else from an Old Testament and New Testament survey, what you will find out is that God entrusts people with things and he gives them mercy and grace and mercy and grace. But a day of judgment comes, a day of reckoning, where he will take it from an unproductive group and give it to a productive group. I don't want to be found in the unproductive group. And throw that worthless servant out into the darkness where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. You know what the saddest part of being thrown out here is? It's, it's not as if he got to enjoy a wonderful life during the harvest and then he goes to outer darkness. His life was miserable the whole time because you know how he spent it? Crippled in fear, hiding like a little ferret looking out of the ground for whatever was going to eat him next. Scared to death to do anything. Scared of God, scared of the harvest, scared of the elements, scared of everything. The sad thing is he didn't lose money. He lost the abundant life. You know what I care about? It's not what you have, it's not what you possess. It's do you have an abundant life? And I've learned not to boast in men's strength, men's riches, or men's wisdom. But I will absolutely boast and understanding the Lord and His purpose for me better. It is the only thing that counts. The only thing worthwhile under the sun. My hope, my prayer for you, is that you will find that. That you will have the courage to pursue it. That you will find the support of your peers, but if none go with you, it is still worth pursuing. Mm -hmm. I hope you go into foreign lands. For you, your foreign land might be your neighbor's yard. Mm -hmm. Might be another floor of your apartment complex. I hope you do daring and bold things for your God because it is, it is the most exhilarating, fulfilling life on earth. And I know no way to get depressed faster, to get purposeless faster, <coughs> to get miserable where there's weeping and gnashing of teeth faster. No way to be surrounded by darkness faster than to reject that which you were designed for. Why don't we join hands? We'll pray for the strength collectively as a group to find what God's called each of us to. And maybe we'll even take a pledge together to support one another in that calling. Like Republicans and Democrats say they'll do every re election year, let's reach across the aisle. <laughs> they lie, but we don't. Mighty God, Lord, we're asking now, as your people, that the secret things that are revealed from you would be dropped into the hearts and the minds of the people. 
That ministries would be born in their hearts. That we can fan into flame. That we can encourage. Lord God, that we can help inspire. That those would be born in the people's lives. That their lives would be fulfilling. That they would feel your anointing upon them. Lord, as your word impacts their life, show them what directions that they can move to properly use their talents. I don't believe anybody in here wants to be displeasing to you. I think they all want to dwell in your favor. Give them the strength, mighty God, to take those steps of faith so that they'll have their stones of remembrance. You are a good God. Lord, as a body now, we pledge to support each other in those callings. No matter how weird, no matter how crazy a thing might be that you've called one of us to do, we pledge to not ridicule, but to stand in support of a God-given purpose. Lord, we pray that you would anoint us all for that purpose, the encouragement of our brothers and sisters. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. Amen. Amen.